So for me, Italo Calvino's Memos for the Millennium, which must have been published at least 20 years ago, where he talked of the new millennium needing lightness, swiftness, exactitude. These qualities are the ones I think we are now bringing into innovation. And social innovation matters because for the last century we have seen huge sums of money going into military R&D, going into hardware and technology, much of it our own money as taxpayers, and this has given us drones and smartphones and so on. But at the same time, our social wealth has stagnated. We see these problems like obesity or drugs or waste or poverty not attended to, not with anything like the same resources and attention that things like killing people have had or finding new ways of, of uh, you know, having supercomputers track the weather. So social innovation is in part a response to this imbalance. And the imbalance of where our brain power goes, the world has put its best brains often onto problems which don't matter, whereas we need the best brains to be addressing the problems which really do matter and actually affect our lives. The good news is we have an extraordinary fertile world of social innovation out there, of projects and programs and ideas, some big, some small. In fact, the world has always done social innovation. What's been missing is the systematic support to help it. And that's, that, that history actually takes us back to the, the 1820s or 1830s when writers first started talking about social innovation to some of the ways of thinking about technology in the last century where the best writers on technology understood that technology was codependent on social change. You could only get the most out of electricity or cars or telephones if social institutions changed in tandem. And that's what's taken us to, I think, what is beginning to be almost a boom in social innovation as we look for these innovations which are social both in their means, how they bring people together to create and in their ends, in their ability to create value. Now what all of that means for me is another sort of metaphor around bees, that in every society, every city, there will be many people with creative social ideas, good solutions, but what they usually lack is the connections to what I call the trees, the big institutions with power and money, sometimes in business, sometimes finance, sometimes government. And what we are trying to do now in this period is link the, the strength of the trees with the creativity of the bees, because the trees cannot renew themselves on their own. The big bureaucracies cannot invent, cannot create, but the bees on their own do not have impact. And how do we think of systemic change? How do we orchestrate all of the elements which could help us get our systems like finance or food out of their, their crises, out of their, their stuck trajectories into something more useful. For me, an interesting good case study is what we did with rubbish, waste. 20 years ago, most of our waste was buried like this. We just dug holes and we put it in the ground. We've tra transformed how we do waste of things like, you know, plastic bottles or electronics. And we recycle high percentages of these. We get energy from waste. There's still further to go, but it's been a dramatic change in the course of a generation. And if you look at why it happened, it happened partly because of policies and regulations and EU directives, partly new technologies, designing cars, for example, so every piece of the car could be reused, new kinds of markets, but critically to changes to our behavior. So we were willing on a Sunday evening to get down on our knees and separate our plastic and our paper and our food waste and our, our, our non-organic waste in a way which was unimaginable 20 or 30 years ago. And this combination of these elements is, is what will be required for all of the big systems change of the next generation, to food, to finance, to transport, to learning, and to health. And anyone in business needs to be aware of this because this will be maybe 80% of the economy 
will be going through these systemic changes, which will be as much about social change and social movements as it will be about new technologies and new markets. I think for us living in Europe, in the midst of this long, slow crisis, it is as if the future is underexposed. We can see the barriers, we can see the causes for misery, fatalism, why things are difficult. And I think we can't see clearly enough what the routes forward might be, how we start now to grow what may be new. I've just brought out a, um, a, a, a book attempting to make sense of previous periods when people felt stuck, but also to see how systems were broken through and transformed. So in the 1930s, for me, the really good examples were how countries like New Zealand and Sweden responded to the financial crisis initially for a few years of just stasis, and they were stuck and frozen, but then reinvented, entirely recreated everything from welfare states to economic models to business models, and with extraordinary success and unlocked a huge amount of value. The final thing I want to say really comes from this, this quote which I, I use in the book, which seems to me the essential question for us as we look ahead. It comes from Canada. And in this story, there is a shaman, an old shaman in the Inuit, who meets a small boy. And the shaman tells the boy that within himself, he has two bears. One is a cruel, warlike, violent bear, and a hunter, and the other is caring, and compassionate, and loving. And the little boy asks him, which of these bears will win? The boy is very frightened by this story. And the shaman tells him, whichever one I feed. Now, for me, this is the central question about our innovation systems, and indeed about our economies and societies. In innovation, which kinds of innovation do we want to feed? At the moment, in the US, the UK, even in India, half of all public money for innovation goes to the military. Is that the innovation we should be feeding? Is that what we most need? I don't think so. And in our society and economy, what kinds of business do we want to feed? What kind of economy, what kind of activity do we want to feed? We have a choice. And uh, the future for me is there to be made. We need to overcome this moment of excess fatalism, the underexposure of the future, and tap into those sources and those forces of change, which at the moment may look weak. But in history, it's often turned out that the moment of greatest pessimism about the future comes fairly shortly before, in fact, we see a tipping point and a breakthrough and the new begins to be born. Thank you.